Anyway, so, uh, yeah, let's get going. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I am delighted to be joined by Matt Kennard, uh, one of the co-authors of Silent Coup. Uh, we've both got our copies here. <laughs> um, so, Matt, you're the co-founder of Declassified UK as well. Yep. Um, why don't you give us like uh, a, an introduction of like how, how and why you came to write this book? Yeah, well, the story goes back quite a way, actually. Um, Myself and Claire met in 2014. We both became fellows at the Centre for Investigative Journalism, um, uh, which is based at Goldsmiths University, uh, not far from here, actually. Um, and Claire had previously been at The Guardian covering development um, and aid, and I was at the Financial Times. I'd recently been in Washington covering all sorts of things. Um, and we, there was a couple of other fellows as well, but me and Claire had a lot in a lot in common we realized in that we both saw um the advent of corporate power and the increasing um entry of corporate power into every part of our society uh, as the biggest issue of the day and i still believe that i think that it's impossible to understand our society and our world if you don't understand it through the lens of corporate power now and how it's basically launched a what we call a silent coup since, particularly since the 1950s, but this has been going on for centuries. Um, so we, um, uh, Claire had, it was actually Claire who had been looking a bit into this um, particular part of this corporate coup, which is an which is called Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. And effectively that describes a shadow legal system that operates across the globe, whereby corporations can sue states for enacting policies they don't like, which they say infringe on their investor rights or even future profits. So Claire had been interested in that. And then we got a call from someone who was <coughs> uh, uh, working in El Salvador. And there was a very sort of emblematic case in El Salvador because a gold mining company had um, not been awarded an environmental permit, uh, which you would think would be a sovereign decision that a government should be able to make. But this corporation had taken the El Salvadoran government, which is a very poor country, um, to um, uh, to court through, it, I should say what this court, the main court where these cases are, are heard is called the Inter International Centre for the Resolution of Investment Disputes, ICSID. Um, and they were taken there for, th uh, and this company claimed wanted $300 million for not being granted this permit. So we went to El Salvador. I mean, I, I don't want to go too deep in, but we went to El Salvador looked at that case, then went to Germany, went to South Africa, went to a whole load of other countries. Um, and as we were going around, um, we we started thinking, well, look, this is one facet of a much bigger supranational system that had been built, particularly since the 1950s, and to replace formal empire, because as formal empires crumbled after the Second World War, um, uh, investors and corporations which were operating in the developing world which were actually getting governments which represented the people rather than uh, their foreign masters were coming into power and they were worried about the security of their investments so they they thought we need to get new ways to ensure that we won't get expropriated or we won't get um, uh, 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 laws that impact our, our operations in adverse ways so we thought we actually, the book is structured into four sections and the next section we, we, we covered was the development and aid industry, um, which is, uh, sounds boring, but development is a word that's used to describe basically how most of humanity runs their economies. Um, and it's very actively, the policies that are pursued by the developing world are, uh, are mostly taken directly from um, Washington, i.e., the World Bank, which is which is based in Washington. Um, and there was a particular part of the World Bank called the International Finance Corporation, um, which is the private sector lending bank, uh, part of the bank. Um, and they give money to a corporation. I mean, in the theory, that the stated theory for the creation of the IFC was it increases prosperity because it allows corporations to go to markets that they wouldn't usually go to um, by getting cheap loans from the World Bank or non-commercial loans. Um, but in reality, what the IFC has become is effectively an invest investment bank, which promotes privatization and deregulation around the world. It has an advisory service, which it advises the developing world governments and then takes um, interest, equity stakes. It can even take equity stakes and gives these loans 
to corporations to go into these markets. Um, that's one facet of it. There's a whole, obviously, another, loads of other parts of the development um, industry, but I don't want to go too far into it. Then the third section, which was one that we saw when we were looking at uh, aid and development, was the the way that corporations from the 1950s onwards, really, um, started a trend of chiseling off physical space from states to allow them to create what we call corporate utopias you know so if you live in if you if, if you working in a state where they have strong unions um minimum wage um tariffs all these all these sorts of things that are hindrance to foreign corporations and foreign direct investment um and you can't change that national government you can create these little zones where you can just do whatever you want um and they they, they actually began in ireland uh um, in shannon um the first um, special economic zone was open was opened in Shannon, um, and we went to Shannon to, to kind of um, uh, to look at the history, and 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 then obviously that model was actually what propelled China to uh, to its economic dominance, which mm. is which is on its way to 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 <laughs> around the world. Um, so we so uh, and that that another facet of that is obviously private cities, charter cities, all these all these different mechanisms through which corporations want to bypass national laws. I'll just finish with this on that issue. There's also what we call a special economic world, because a lot of the um, kind of corporate utopian policies, which are trialed in these special economic zones, then become later on down the line, you see become national policy. So, so we're living in a kind of special economic world now. And then the final part of that, which we saw where we're looking at special economic zones was the advent of private security and military companies. Um, and that became a kind of quite a mainstream issue during the war war on terror mm -hmm. in Iraq because of, uh, I can't remember if it was 2007 or eight. There were more private contractors, U.S. private contractors in Iraq than there were actual Department of Defense personnel. So, uh, and that that was kind of the first time where the society at large saw it. But this has been something that's been going on for years um, and has really accelerated. Uh, particularly since the turn of the millennium. So, um, and that has huge um, implications for democracy mm -hmm. because a lot of sort of sociologists, political philosophers um, say that the, the, the political power under, undergirding that really is the, is the right to resort to force. Now, if that is moving from the state um, to corporations, that is a extremely worrying thing for anyone who who, who who wants to live in a democracy or wants to have some say over the forces which which govern our world. So we looked into that. We went we went to Israel and Palestine um, because the, the the occupation of uh, Palestine is a lot of it's being subcontracted out now by the Israelis to mm -hmm. private contractors. Um, I went to Colombia um, because there's a flagship case where the banana company Chiquita, which used to be called United Fruit changed its name because it had such a bad brand, but they, 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 they're in court or they were in court in the United States under the alien tort statute for, um, uh, violate for, for getting, um, private contractors and, um, vigilantes to kill trade unionists and, um, labor, labor organizers. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the structure of the book, a very, very quick, um, and obviously you come away after looking at that, just thinking, wow, we're up against it, you know, mm -hmm. because these are mechanisms which one are very, very powerful, but maybe more importantly, no one knows about. So it's for, you, I'm explaining through the through the process of reporting this and and researching it, I'd explain these systems to people, and they'd be like, "What? You can't be serious, you know? Mm -hmm. This 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 is hugely important. Why have I never heard about it?" And basically, they and we do deal with this in the book that these systems and the through which corporations are exerting power have uh, basically um, risen completely without any accountability at all in terms of the media or there's parts of academia that have done it but often by marginalized academics like mm -hmm. there's not they're not mainstream issues either in academia or the media and that needs to change um, uh, and hopefully this book will go some way to doing that but it needs to obviously be a a, a, a much bigger effort I would I'll finish with this that it's it's not a big issue here, but actually, when you go to some of the places that are being affected by these systems, it's a huge issue. So in El Salvador, ICSID, that 
arm of the World Bank where a lot of these cases are heard that um, uh, that where they were taken to court for this mining company. Everyone, in, well, nearly everyone in El Salvador has heard of ICSID. They call mm-hmm. it CIADI, that's its Spanish acronym. But it was kind of amazing going there because it, they're, they're really alive to the issue and they're fighting it hard and they actually eventually won. Um, so we need to get uh, that kind of awareness in the in the West, which is where all these systems are based. And actually, I think that that will happen because one of the other trends that we talk about in the book is what we call the boomerang effect in that a lot of these strategies, mechanisms uh, to enforce corporate power in the developing world are now coming back to haunt um, the the states that created them. Mm-hmm. So we went to Germany because they they got a legal mm-hmm. case against them by a Swedish company for for uh, for their program of um, um, uh, getting rid of their nuclear power after the Fukushima disaster and mm-hmm. and and other things. So I think increasingly uh, these things will become an issue. And TTIP, I don't know if you remember that, um, which was the the mooted EU US mm-hmm. uh, trade agreement, which was going to be the biggest trade agreement in history. Um, there was uh, that was going to include it hasn't happened I don't know if it's still going to happen I, I think they've kind of shelved it yeah but it's, I haven't heard anything no about it they did shelve, there was a lot of pushback and one of the main reasons for the pushback was it, it was the US wanted to include ISDS uh, sorry investor state dispute so mm-hmm. allow um, corporations to sue the states that were part of TTIP so it was it became a bit issue for a while there but then it went it went qu- quiet again yeah like what what you said there about about people not understanding it is deaf because as, as soon as you start to explain this to people, they do they're just like, hang on, um, no, what? That's insane. Like that shouldn't be the way it is. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I've been I've been party to at least like like understanding of some of the mechanisms and stuff that you you've mentioned in the book because it's been reported by by people like um, Naomi Klein and yeah. some of her like in like No Logo in the Shock yeah. Doctrine. Um, Kojo Koram, I don't know if you know, uh, he, he did a book about basically, um, it was about the the transition from the colonial empire into like corporate empire. So mm. he, like touched on some of the stuff that you mentioned about like the earth sort of, yeah, post World War Two um, transition into this world. But how do you go around the world, right, and and report on all of this and and look at, at just how how much control corporations have over states all around the world with such little accountability, even in the press, like just no, no one challenging them on the decisions they've, they've decided to make. How do you not become horrendously cynical about the position we're currently in? Like what, what keeps you like motivated to continue to be outraged about this stuff? Yeah. Well, it's a good question. And actually, uh, the answer for me is often to look at the um, movements, um, leaders, countries that are breaking free of it, because it does. The, the, it, it seems like the control of the corporate empire is very solid, but it's not, and there's cracks in that edifice all the time. And <clears throat> one one particular example is Bolivia, who um, and actually not just Bolivia, Ecuador and. Uh, Venezuela under Chavez, they those three countries tried to withdraw from ICSID and in fact did withdraw from ICSID. So there were and they the, the funny thing about these um, and and they withdrew withdrew from treaties that enshrined the ISDS system. And the funny thing is that you find out quickly that they they have ways of getting around that as well. The 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 World Bank they have these things called sunset clauses where if you withdraw from a treaty they still stand for 10, 20 years. So what that means is it's usually long enough for them to get that government out and get another one in and they can they can reinstate it. So that's, it's hard. To... That's like corporate servitude. Yeah, man. it is. It is. But that's but that's what the, it's all about. That it's all about creating a system that ensures against risk. And that's the other thing about the the legal system, which was amazing to me, because, you know, when you go when you when you come up against these systems, they've all got a lot of ideology stacked on top of them to explain to you why they're good for the world Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, and all the wonderful things that they do. The ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement System, is one of the only ones I've come across where even the people that are in it can't really explain why it's there apart from it's to help corporations. The only argument that they make is it helps private, uh, sorry, foreign investment in the developing world because investors are, um, are much less fearful of investing in certain places because they know if they get expropriated, they'll, or whatever it is, they'll, they'll, have recourse to these courts um but that's 
totally against how capitalism is meant to work because capitalism is all about risk and reward, isn't it? Like mm. if you go to the Congo uh, and, and start mining, um, you might get expropriated by the government. It's not, there's not a strong regulatory structure, but that's why you go, you, you're going to get huge returns. Mm. If you get, if you're insured against anything bad happening to you, that's, that's risk-free capitalism. Um, and when I was saying that to the, I, we did talk to people within the world bank about this stuff. They're kind of like, yeah, uh, they don't really have an argument against it. So it's one of the few systems I've come across where it's, they, they can't even explain why it exists. Um, but, but there is, uh, an amazing resistance to what, uh, to to what we what I've described, and that's what keeps you going, and that's what excites you when you go around the world. Because, um, uh, especially in El Salvador, that was one that that for me was probably the most profound experience I had because because of the level of knowledge about the system, but also the fact that they um, had in, uh, actually in, uh, enforced laws there where they banned it was the first uh, outright national ban of um, metallic mining in the world. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, because of that, uh, mining had become so unpopular, and there was a government that actually um, it was it was a, it was a political party that came out of the the civil war uh, mm. the the Marxist guerrillas that came out of the civil war. Um, uh, so they'd enacted this policy, and 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 then Bolivia, there was Argentina. We went to that was had, had some amazing um, stories of workers taking over factories and expropriating from companies. Um, so. That's what keeps me going. Um, and I hope we get that across in the book because everywhere we go, we try and tell the stories of the people resisting it. And and the the, the mad thing is their stories are just silenced. They, they don't exist in the Western media, even on the so-called liberal left, like The Guardian, you just don't yeah. hear the resistance to, yeah. to these. It, and it's so, um, part of the reason is that the, the, the information system we have is owned by corporations, most of it. So you're not going to get the truth about what the Soviet Union is doing from Pravda, from a Soviet-owned <laughs> um, uh, newspaper, a yeah. government regime-owned newspaper. Why do you expect to get the truth about the corporate empire from a corporate-owned newspaper? There's a structural reason we don't hear these stories, um, but they're happening. And I think, interestingly, like in the society we live in, more and more you're seeing people understanding that there is this massive power that exists off-screen. Um, part of that is expressing itself in wild conspiracy theories, mm. like um, desperate conspiracy theories. I don't know about um, George Soros um, running the world or <laughs> like, uh, you know, or COVID being uh, 5G, like all these crazy yeah, things. Yeah. But I, I think the root of a lot of people's desperation and, and need for answers, they feel when they're watching TV that the people, they're, the politicians they're watching, they're not the ones making the decision and, and they're right. Mm -hmm. But there's just no uh, um, conceptual... Um, framework for them to attach themselves to that's rooted in reality so then they go for these wild theories but i think this kind of this book and there's there's obviously a, plenty of other literature which uh, explains how corporations have eaten the state and how the state effectively doesn't work for the people anymore um that they that we need to get out there because the more and more that there, there's this desperation and this understanding that we don't have the we don't have power or the people don't have power anymore if that's not answered with a with a rational and um, uh, uh, analysis rooted in facts, mm. then it opens itself up for fascists and demagogues and all sorts of people to come along and say, "I don't know, it's one group." You know, yeah. this is how this is how that kind of thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, and corporations also. The other thing that they've how they've mangled the discourse is this move into ob uh, obsession with identity politics yeah. which you see in in the in the western world it's here this yeah, country yeah. and the us i'm not so much sure about if it's big in europe in the same uh, way but... it's definitely there yeah, yeah exactly see, see and i don't think that's a coincidence you know that um we all spend our whole time talking about these issues which are completely um divorced from structural stuff i mean i'm not saying that gay rights and uh, trans rights and all this stuff aren't important issues, but it's about the proportion that we talk about them. Yeah. It's well, just no, they're, wild. they're using the, them as a smokescreen to exactly. get away with other stuff. It's like look, like JP Morgan with their with their pride parade. Like, look at us, we're great. Exactly. We're, we're your friends. Exactly. Like, whilst they're like defrauding people. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. And, and, and the, it works. Like, the, I think that the left is kind of destroyed the left in many ways. Like, the, the obsession yeah. with talking about identity politics the whole time yeah um because well, if you if you try well, i think the problem is what happens is like you it's very difficult to have that conversation where you go this this is important 
like mm. human rights, like people's like a bit of freedom to do what they like yep. is really important. But like you can you can agree with those things, but like please look at the massive thing, exactly. this huge thing that's that like all the stuff that you you've articulated in the book. And it doesn't really exist in the in Latin America I know more about. Um that that that, that people talk about real that well not People talk about those sort of serious structural economic issues like nationalization and funding for for um, schools and education and stuff on a much more in a much more solid way than you get here. Now it's often just yeah, really like... surface identity politics, really toxic debates. Um, yeah, so I, so I think that they've succeeded in that. So there needs to be some reckoning. I think particularly on the progressive left about what has been done to. Yeah the left by uh, corporate um, friendly identity politics. You know? Yeah. I mean, like Cor Corbyn, I think was a bit of an expression of, of like an attempt of like the real quote unquote real left to like reestablish themselves a bit. But, but then what happens is like through the media, like the corporate owned media, you, like you get tagged on to like, instead of looking at all these amazing things that like Corbyn might be proposing that could really help the, the, the country, like investment in education, public transport, um, attempting to cut down like corporate tax loopholes, things yeah. like that. Then they just zoom in on the yeah, but look, he thinks this about trans people. Yeah, Therefore, exactly. he's the devil. Exactly. Like, and then yeah. it just becomes a fight about that instead yeah. of the thing that everyone I think broadly would agree on. It's yeah. just like corporations have too much power. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think what you said about the this, like the the lack of articulation of it is really important because I was going to ask is like, do you like to to what extent do you think the sort of the anti-establishment sentiment that we've seen take take hold in a lot of places over the past decade or so, like starting probably with like the Brexit vote, um, Trump, there was then there's like the, the oh, I can't remember which party it is, like the right wing one in Sweden took over. You had like um, Le Pen in France, you had um, Maloney now in, in Italy and all of these, all of these things are like, uh, to me, I don't like everyone looks at them like, oh, it's like xenophobia. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like they're, they're, they're expressing mm -hmm. like, an, they're expressing uh, some sort of concern about the lack of power that they feel that they have within their own country. Yep. It's like, it's literally take back control. Mm -hmm. Like Dominic Cummings for all his fucking shortfalls. Like that phrase couldn't have been more perfect to tap into that feeling. Like, right. do you, how much do you think that that is just what's what's happening here? Is that do you see that as an expression of this like desperation? Definitely, and I think that that's that is what I'm, I'm talking about. Is that there is the the mainstream left has abandoned um, the working class in terms of talking to them about the issues they care about, um, and when there's when the, when the mainstream left's not talking to them, the the xenophobic right is talking to them and is using language which they understand like for example you mentioned this whole feeling of like losing control and in in uh to to these global forces they the right the, use this term now globalist mm. and there's some truth to that there are institutions which want to create um a, a harmonized international market for mm. for transnational capital and have done <laughs> but it's only a marginal part of the left that talks about that that's way outside the mainstream. Jeremy Corbyn was one of them, but he was destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you look at the mainstream centre, what's called centre-left parties like Labour under Starmer or Macron, who's called a centrist, they will never enunciate any kind of critique of this system, which is real, of transnational um, power and tr and supranational systems of governance, which take power outside of time. So if you don't have that, where are you going to go? And it also goes for for criti criticism of the state. One very um, um, striking um, trend that I've noticed is how you cannot have any kind of anti-imperial analysis, anti-imperialist analysis on any centre-left, centre or centre-right um, media now in the West. You can have it on the far left, but we don't have any far left media. But no. But you also can on the far, sort of far right, like... If you look at uh, the United States, the only news uh, TV channel you can hear any kind of anti-imperialist critique is is Tucker Carlson's show yeah. on Fox News, yeah, which is insane. Which is right? insane. He's a, he is a, not a nice guy, I mean, and he's with bad politics. But he's the only one that's allowing on people to 
to really speak sense about the like there was a he had Jimmy Dore on who I know is a controversial figure but he I love Jimmy Dore yeah yeah but he's hated by parts of the yeah, no. part, yeah. but he was went on he he put across and um, uh, some truths that I just never thought I would see on corporate media anywhere. I, that recently, I don't know if you saw that clip. It was about uh, two minutes about the, about mm -hmm. America at war mm -hmm. uh, and, and imperialism and all this. I was like, wow, you would never, ever, ever hear that on CNN, BBC, no. ever. So that is really, really um, worrying because when the only outlets are on the sort of right, far, the sort of Outer reaches of the right mm. uh, and the murder kind of media. Where is all? Where's all the? And where's all that energy that we're talking about? This anti-establishment feeling of like losing control. Where's it all going to go? It's going to go there. They're not seeing it from anyone else, yeah. and they're not seeing an analysis which roots it in, in 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 the in the real world. Because the other thing is that Trump used that kind of rhetoric mm -hmm. and got elected on it, and then stuffed his cabinet full of Goldman Sachs people. Well, yeah. So. So that's that's the problem, you know. So it, they they talk the anti-establishment uh, rhetoric, people like Trump, but they don't they don't uh, actually enact it. Whereas we we need people who will actually do it, like Jeremy Corbyn mm. um, and others, Mélenchon in France, there's others as well in Europe. Yeah. But they need to stop. Liberals are more scared of people like that than they are of the right. Yeah. Ironically. Which is which is crazy. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. I think it's. It's like, uh, I think the reason that the right can get away with it more is because they still tend to be like quite supportive of corporate power. Yeah. Whereas when you see it on the left, people immediately are like, well, they're going to take all their, you know, they're going to, they're going to storm the palace and steal yeah. everything. Do you know yeah. what I mean? They, they, they see the word, the, the most extreme expression of that as, as coming down the road. Yeah. I think that's why that the right gets away with it maybe a little more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the right has traditionally been much more in favor of corporate power, obviously, because, the left, in theory, is meant to be set up to represent workers. Yeah. And workers have been uh, um, working to get their rights from corporations from for centuries. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm still trying to find out or trying to... People ask me who I'm going to vote for the next election. I'm just like, bro, I have no idea. I'll like, probably vote Green. <laughs> but I, don't, I probably won't vote, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Unless unless someone comes out of the woodwork or yeah. something or like I don't know, Corbyn's Peace and Justice Party, yeah, not but I'm not in Islington, so it's probably a waste. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, who who do you think is 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 most to blame here, or is like the biggest threat? Because like the obviously like you're saying, okay, right, corporations are lobbying for these things, but you know, governments have to agree it. Um, the financial world has to sort of fund it. Um, the intelligence agencies, in a lot of cases, are part of maintaining or at least the military or part of like maintaining the power structure that exists mm. um the press have failed to report on it like, like who do you see as most culpable here um i don't know if anyone any particular group is most culpable i think that every every part of our society has been captured so then i think it's a conceptual mistake to think of the corporation as separate to the state and these other actors that you're talking about, because essentially they colonized every part of our society. Mm -hmm. The state is not working for us. It's working for corporate power. And it, it has done uh, uh, throughout history, but it's so pronounced now, you know, like uh, there's whole sections of, for example, the, the British state, which is set up to sell pri uh, BAE systems weaponry around the world. There's something called um, the defense and security organization within the department of international trade which is literally set up to sell private uh, corporate uh, arms around the world um and there's many many other examples um so i think that when you understand that and th then you think well what we need to do is have a, people need to understand that all these institutions have been colonized and we need to take them back because they're not going to work but they're not going to work any other way until we take back the power and it's just it's not just in the developed world if you go to i went to so we went to 30 countries for this book and we talked to people who are on the wrong end of corporate um oppression and exploitation all over the world and nearly every time i asked one say a peasant in tanzania or or some some trade unionist in colombia what about the government why aren't they supporting you against the corporation uh, in your battle and they'd say the government 
the, the government works for the corporation, not us. Everyone said that. Mm. And it was, they understand that. And it's very clear on the ground because you do. And, and that's because the government, uh, the corporation has all the money. It has all the power. It can buy the lawyers. It can, it, it, it often puts people, uh, th there's a revolving door with government. So uh, it, when you start looking at it like that and you understand you know, that there's no differentiation, there's no uh, siloing of, of corporate power from anything that um, has uh, any other power center in our society, then you realize it's no one's fault. But what we need to do is have a clear eyed analysis of that and take them back and reclaim democracy and reclaim the institutions which claim to act in our name. Uh, it's hard to do that because these forces are so powerful and we're not, I mean, my, 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 my take is that the only, the only counter force, which is, has a, which has a power, which could bring about change and, and change the situation is organized labor. Um, because, uh, traditionally, obviously they've been a great, uh, uh, dynamic force, which has changed society for the better, but they've been shattered by corporate power as well, uh, and bought off and, uh, there's a hierarchy uh, of, of labor power in itself. So it's difficult, um, but I don't blame anyone because I, I think that the, well, I obviously blame the, the people that are, that are working in the system because they don't have to do that. But, but the, 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 how, the, how the system created itself, it's a, it's a Frankenstein's monster. That's the thing, like uh, just to give you a, a brief history of the corporation, the corporation was originally or in its modern incarnation, uh, you used to have to get a charter. This is like in the 16th century England, you used to have to get a charter from the crown or occasionally the parliament to, to, uh, to start a corporation. And they would give you, it was a privilege, it wasn't a right. And then gradually over the following centuries, the corporate form became unhinged from the state that created it. Um, so before that they could, there was, if they gave you a charter, they could also take that charter away. It was time limited. It was for one project to do one thing. So it was very clear that the state was in control and they can take that control back as soon as they wanted. Mm. Mainly in the 19th century here and in the US, um, that changed and the, the, and it was changed through legislation, but also court judgments whereby corporations were just fighting a civil rights battle basically. Um, and they won conclusively. Uh, and won the right to take over a lot of the functions of the state. Um, and that went, this is what, to take you up to the book, the book deals with how that went global after the end of the Second World War, um, when uh, that corp, when the corporate victories that had been won domestically, they, they enacted globally. So there was a whole supranational system set up to ensure that they could govern the world um, without um, having to worry about uh, nuisances like liberation leaders or, 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 yeah. uh, or laws that they yeah. didn't, that, that impacted their profits. Yeah. Those small nuisances like, you know, the law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. yeah I mean, then, that's quite explicit in some, some of the documents we looked at, like from the, like they, they lit, people were literally saying, we we're worried about the fact that these new democratic and independent governments might enact laws that would, that would damage our profits. They were that, that that's explicit for the creation of a lot of these systems as well. so like were you, you was there a specific meeting or group of people who were who were driving this forward in the like cause i can't remember the name of the german guy Herman worked, Abs, yeah. that's the one yeah um so like what what was there so right world war ii finishes mm. You know, everyone sat around being like, well, well, the British Empire is pretty much done. German Empire, definitely done. Mm. French, you know, it's being dismantled. Although the French have managed to hang on to more territories than most. Yeah. <laughs> but like the, we're watching the end of, of, of that era of colonialism, in a sense. And like, what, when did they say or realize, but like, right, okay, we need something new here. Like this is going to yeah. get, you know, we might, we might lose our profits, boys, yeah. or we know, we're not going to have as much influence. We can't just dive into Africa and do whatever the fuck we want now. Yeah. It's a good question. And it, is, it was a gradual process that the Bretton Woods Conference, which is seen as kind of the, the most important moment, I suppose, in the post-war economic settlement mm -hmm. uh, was 1944. Um, and that's when the World Bank was created. It was originally called um, the Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and it was focused on reconstructing Europe uh, and then the IMF. Um, and then they wanted to create a, WT, uh, a World Trade Organization, but that came a a couple of years later with the general agreement on trade and tariffs mm -hmm. which is GATT 
which then became the WTO in 1995. It took that long for the WTO to be established. But that kind of structure um, was about was was about um, expanding corporate control, and that's why you saw. And it was mainly um, the architect was mainly the US, because at that moment the US and they they came out of the Second World War by far the most powerful economically uh, and in other ways country in the world, and they wanted to inf uh, use that power to to expand. Um, and the British were a kind of hindrance to that. So there was this debate at Bretton Woods between Harry Dexter White, who was the US negotiator, and John Maynard Keynes, who was the British mm -hmm. one. And effectively, Dexter White... I didn't realise Keynes. Huh? I didn't realise Keynes was the Yeah, Keynes was the, the guy. But he didn't win on a lot of the arguments because they, he didn't have the power. But they, he won on some, and there was a... There was a there was some there was some Keynesian elements to the the post war settlement, but effectively, especially with GAP, GAP was about lowering tariffs um, and making trade much easier, and that was a massive boon for for, for corporate power. So corporations could could expand uh, uh, into new countries without a lot of the regulation that they'd previously had. It wasn't it was intermittent success with GAP, but there was some. Um, but I think. To, to answer your question, so for example, with with the IFC, which I mentioned, which is the private sector lending arm of the bank, that was 1956 that was founded, and the context of that was the the developing um, anti-colonial um, movements and the end of empire, which accelerated in the 50s, really, um, and then ICSID, which I also mentioned, which is the venue for these legal cases, that was created in 1966. So you see that in, it was in the 50s and 60s, these people were getting together and saying, wow, we really need to create new institutions to uh, ensure that we maintain control. Um, uh, and that came, and obviously they were, IFC and ICSID were created within the framework of Bretton Woods because they both became part of the World Bank. So it was, I'd say like 20 years post, post Second World War, they were kind of, was the time that they were the architects would develop the system that we live in now. But during the Cold War, it was kind of um, kept in a box a bit because there was another superpower mm -hmm. that, would, that, that developing countries could organize around. And actually what you see with the IFC and ICSID particularly um, is that they exploded after the end of the Cold War. Huge amounts, many, many more cases were her uh, ISDS cases were were registered after the end of the Cold War. IFC got um, expanded rapidly after the end of the Cold War because it was kind of triumphant capitalism they won, and obviously it was triumphant corporate capitalism as well. So they were greasing the entry of all these corporations into the previous Soviet orbit, um, and now there's there's not really any. Um, there's not really any structural opponent because the Soviet Union was communist, whereas China is kind of communist capitalist. It's, it's hyper capitalist and communist at the same time. Yeah. So we went to Shenzhen, which is the special economic zone next to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and it was opened in 1980. It's now the biggest um, uh, special economic zone, and it's just it's like it's a form of capitalism that like Western capitalists can even dream of. Like yeah. the workers are completely um, uh, beaten down and, and, and without rights and they, and, and it's a, it's a corporate utopia. So there's not really any, uh, a, a nation state or superpower level op op opponent of this corporate system. So, um, yeah, it's, it's taken off massively. I don't, uh, I think that, yeah, the, the, those are the stages. So it's the Second World War, the 20 years after the Second World War, and then the explosion after the end of the Cold War. Yeah, because it really did like the sort of the like Chicago boys driven like financialization of a lot of those economies really started in that in that period as well. Like it started in started in the, the US to an extent in the 90s, like yeah, post post Russia or post Soviet Yugoslavia. Um you could even look at like yeah, there was definitely there was it was happening in a lot of the Asian economies, and that's yeah. when that's when it really happened in China as well. It was like yeah. that, that period really um, 80s, yeah. changed changed the world really. It did, and also the seventies as well, because that was the kind of the structure. So the OPEC oil crisis in nineteen seventy three created a debt crisis, which the Bretton Woods institutions used to increase their control, mm. especially in Latin America. Um, they, they went in and said, you have to restructure. If you want to get um, emergency 
um, loans from us, or um, you're going to have to do X, Y, Z. And X, Y, Z was get rid of all your um, capital controls, mm -hmm. deregulate your economies, uh, get rid of tariffs, get rid of subsidies for, for um, food or whatever it is. So it was a really orientating uh, Latin America into, and this happened globally as well, but orientating it into what was called the Washington Consensus. You yeah. know? And that happened in the, in, the, in the middle to late 70s, but and then exploded in the 80s with mm. Thatcher and Reagan. Yeah, um, it's this uh, Pinochet. Yeah. Um, and oh, I can't remember the name of the Bolivian guy. It's going to not, it's going to escape me. Anyway, but yeah. It, Jeffrey it, Sachs. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah. he's now actually a very good good analyst yeah he's yeah he's reformed that's hilarious yeah after building the system yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah it was it, it's it it's terrifying when you start to realize that there's like not a secret history of the world but there's like mm. it's there's it's like okay there's what we know here yeah. and that it's like it's like the iceberg mm. and there's, there's all the other stuff underneath yeah. that's actually going on but uh, it's it it's it's a really important point you make because as I said earlier, like every one of these systems has a huge amount of ideology uh, uh, put on top of it to kind of legitimate it and explain it to society at large as much as they have to, because of, as we said, some some of it's just not covered at all. But when it is explained, it's there's it's always about doing good for people, mm -hmm. and that kind of propaganda, corporate propaganda, establishment propaganda goes seamlessly into the media because they don't critique it. Yeah. So. Even, so the understanding is is a establishment understanding of the system. So th this kind of book is very, is hard to do because you're constantly having. It's hard work to pick apart the propaganda and try to understand. It's much easier just to get told what how it works. Yeah. But when you start understanding um, that you that all these all these systems are uh, have a huge amount of propaganda just to explain them, you, you you can you can start picking apart. And as I said, like in the developing world, they've done that. They they see it on the ground. There's no you can't argue with the facts on the ground. Mm. But um, in the imperial capitals like Washington and London, nearly all the journalists I can guarantee who work at the Financial Times or uh, even the Guardian, if you talk to them about the World Bank and stuff, they will they will regurgitate World Bank propaganda. They'll say that the World Bank is uh, its mission is to reduce poverty and, and increase prosperity without saying that's the stated aim. That's what yeah. I always say. I mean, that, that is their stated aim, but it's not tr it's not the reality. So we have a captured media class which doesn't do its job of analyzing and picking apart the pro corporate propaganda. So it that is I think that's the that's the really important thing we need to do. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because as I say, we're, we we live in a system in a world where corporations basically run everything like even like the books being published by bloomsbury which is <laughs> listed on the stock market yeah, yeah. one of the few publishers is huge so so uh, in this case i think the probably the the motive the, the profit seeking motive allows allows for little windows where they think they might make a bit of money out of the book but yeah. essentially you, you you're, you're up against an edifice and you, you, like which is which is full of um uh, these institutions, but also journalists, academics, they're all part of the same system, corporate system. So mm -hmm. you need, it's like you're pushing like a 10 ton truck with a toothpick, trying to like go up against it, but. Yeah, yeah, and well, I mean, Bloomsbury are probably counting on you not selling 40 million copies and starting yeah. a revolution. Exactly, <laughs> but they don't know, that is. That. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> go and buy it, guys. Yeah, exactly. it's great, great read, um, but like, if. I think what happens in a lot of cases as well is you, there's like these trigger words, right? That people hear, especially in, in corporate journalism. Like when you start talking about the World Bank or the IMF or the Washington Consensus or the Trilateral Commission or mm. like the Council on Foreign Relations or like any of these groups that have such a massive like influence, but like shadow influence upon like international policy. It's like they hear those words and then it's like, I've heard a conspiracy theorist mention this before. This must be bullshit. Mm. And what happens is then there's like, it's just the shutters go down. There's no like legitimate discussion of what, what's going on with, with these or what these institutions are doing and what they're designed to do and what's actually happening. Like, like one of the most revelatory parts of the book for me was the use of foreign aid. I did not realize like A, how much money is involved in it and B, how little oversight there is. Mm. I was under the impression that foreign aid was like, okay, maybe it's some wasted money. Like governments are always going to waste mm. a bit of money, mm. but that they were probably, you know, 
I don't know, building wells for mm. people or I don't know, schools in like rural Ghana or like, you know, yeah. doing things that might actually be actually aiding the country. Yeah. It turns out, no, it's just like another faucet of money exactly. for, for corporations to go in and like build up the infrastructure for them to then exploit the nation where they're building it and have someone fund it and basically ensure their risk as that's well. It. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it was mind blowing. And it's like, how do you think we get, find the language to yeah. speak about this? in a way that allows us to like break past those like shutters that yeah, come down. That's a good question. And to go directly to your point, I, I totally agree with that. And I <clears throat> but I think that, that is a function of the forces that are reigned against us having a rational, clear eyed analysis of the world. They want people to switch off and think that it's conspiracy theory. So that's why it's pushed. Mm. So uh, that it's not a coincidence that you can't talk about the World Bank or IMF without people thinking, oh, you're, you're a conspiracy theorist, because they are hugely powerful. And those institutions want people to not under, not not hear critiques of them or not take them seriously, at least. Mm. So I think that it's harder to dismiss us because, uh, as, like, as you said, it's very, very heavily researched. I was at the Financial Times, Claire was at The Guardian. We, we're harder to dismiss, but but we need to just understand that the media is set up to protect these forces. And part of that is to make anyone who is critiquing them seem crazy. That If you're not hearing it in the mainstream, then you think it's crazy, but that but, but, but we need, but there's no other way around that than just to have an open mind, you know? Mm. We just got to understand that the reason these truths are not being enunciated in the mainstream is because there's no space for them because these spaces are colonized by corporate power and state power. Uh, it goes for the same with what I do with my day job, which is cover the, the uh, uh, UK foreign policy. Now, when you start looking into it, the role of intelligence and what's called the deep state, which is another of these terms, is huge in our society. And and, and there is, there's a whole academic literature about it. They call it parapolitics, mm -hmm. which is like politics, which is done uh, secretly. And it has huge amounts of, uh, of power now and has historically. But you literally, it's even more than a well back in my life. You can't have any kind of analysis without, without people just being like, oh, no, you said MI6, you must be crazy sort of thing. And it's infuriating. But there's no real way around it uh, apart from just being really, really rigorous with all your facts and rooting. never, I never try and never make a claim mm -hmm. about this stuff or the stuff I cover in my day job that isn't, uh, ha isn't backed by hard evidence. It's always got, don't just use a phrase that, in fact, I don't use deep state because it's so toxic, but, yeah. but national security state I use, mm. uh, and, but, but have an idea of what you're describing when you use that, not just use a term. So I think that's the only way we do it. And um, uh, the, the funny thing is that how, when the establishment can't dismiss you as a conspiracy theorist, they'll just ignore you. Yeah. That's the, that's the, the, when they can't dismiss you because you have a sort of more sort of uh, uh, um, a history in institutions which are less easy to dismiss like the Financial Times or the Guardian, they'll just ignore you. Mm. Or, <laughs> The funny, well, I wrote my, my second book was called The Racket and it was based on reporting I did for the Financial Times but about American imperialism. And it was reviewed in The Guardian and it was compared to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in the first paragraph. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is the anti Semitic forgery yeah, from yeah, Zionist yeah, yeah. Russia. Um, and that was, and the guy who reviewed, <laughs> the guy who reviewed it didn't mention once in the whole review that I, uh, that I'd worked for the Financial Times, so it was a real hit job. It was you don't. It wasn't a mistake. That the way he painted the book was impossible. Would have been impossible if he'd have mentioned that I was at the Financial Times. So, uh, and it actually, when that book was released, I was told by an old friend at the Financial Times that they overheard someone saying, "Oh, we should do a hit job on that book." And his the person he was speaking to said, "No, much better just ignore it." And they did ignore it. And that's much better, more effective way. Of controlling uh, we'll see what happens with this yeah yeah but um marginalizing um truths that uh, uh, threaten it threaten the system is much more effective way of doing it than mm. even getting into a flame war of any sort yeah well it's a much better way of avoiding like the strike sound effect yeah exactly that, mm. yeah if you if you if it doesn't exist just don't talk about it and it just will not like people are just not exactly because the guardian review that i mentioned that was a hit job um <clears throat> actually did quite did quite good things for the book because people got pissed off about it and there was some back and forth mm. 
So yeah, I think it's just much better to marginalize marginalize these ideas. Yeah, like Corbin said, I think similar thing about about the the mail, the Daily Mail in the 2017 campaign. He was like, yeah. They wrote 26 pages about me, and then two days later, I was up five points in the poll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, cracked me up, and that's, yeah. that's often what will happen. Um, so, like, how do you think we go about recapturing those media spaces? Like, what, what, do you think we have a have a hope of of people losing their faith in those institutions? Because, like, people have talked a long time, be like, oh, the corporate media will collapse because there's no money in in it. And I think people are naive in expecting the corporations and, you know, states who are benefiting very, very much from the style of type of reporting to, to allow them to collapse. Like they'll prop them up financially, like the, some billionaire will buy them and, and, you know, it doesn't matter if it's run at a loss because mm. the loss is far less than the, the value that they're providing to the system. Mm. So like, do you think we have a space in the UK are a chance to to build up some more independent media outlets because like I'm, and I always look at America for like what's going to happen in the next five years so they're, mm. they're really starting to build up quite a lot of like more independent like people who you know sometimes I'm a little skeptical about you know whether they're getting they're grifting or whether you know they're just sort of maybe misguided or you know you don't have to agree with everything they say but you know yeah. there's there's people like um, I hesitate to use them because they got a bunch of corporate money. But initially, there was the idea of the Young Turks. Yeah. Um, there was like on the right, there's like Tim Pool. Yeah. Um, there's uh, Stephen Crowder, who's like what is it, like seven million subscribers mm. on YouTube. And then there's a big dispute you have with the Daily Wire. I don't know what the fuck's going on with it now. Yeah. But like we're starting to see like individual people prop up who who do not seem to be beholden to corporate power as much, and they have yeah. sort of more freedom. And then they they re then. Like they, they will reach a point and then they'll start to blow the fuck up because of the authenticity and then they'll get like hit piece after hit piece yeah, after yeah, hit yeah, piece. Yeah. All the skeletons come out of the closet, some real, some probably invented. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, do you see there being a possibility for us to build those sorts of institutions in the UK? Yeah, I do. And actually the UK is quite an exciting place <clears throat> for independent media. Like uh, <laughs> I've always found Brit British politics uh, and journalism quite boring to be honest with you but it that is one of the few times that actually Britain is one of the sort of at, at, at the cutting edge of independent media I don't know if you've heard of places like the Bristol Cable um, there's other independent sort of localized media and declassified UK w yeah. where I work um, but it's hard like, uh, t t to go into t t I have some quite like uh, uh, at the coalface experience with this because of declassified we we don't take money from corporations or governments mm -hmm. as a rule um which to be honest with you even if it was like an existential problem for us we'd probably just shut up shop because the independence of our reporting is the most important thing if we can't do it independently anymore there's no point doing it but you realize that like every incentive for any media startup is to move into to be submerged mm -hmm. in that system so unless you were really strict about it, it's it's uh, it's hard to uh, to to uh, to stay outside that 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 system, which is effectively set up to stop truthful reporting, because the interests that fund media, whether it be state or corporate, they're not there for charity. They want to get the, the, the they may not explicitly say we want you to write X Y Z, but mm -hmm. that slowly slowly you become you become more and more uh, friendly to those those power centers and you see it with someone like the guardian you know like the, mm. the corporate logos are everywhere it's all the, over there they're and, the ones that disappoint me the yeah. most because that like i remember maybe 10 years ago it's like right okay yeah they're a bit preachy okay fair enough maybe there's some like establishment status quo journalists in there but they were still doing solid investigative were, reporting yeah. at that point and now it's just like where the fuck did that go yeah well we we the first investigation we did for declassified actually was about what happened to the guardian from 2013 but that was more about the security services sort of um national security state coming down hard on them after the snowden mm. revelations it wasn't really about the corporate angle but the corporate angle is maybe even more extreme like if you look at their website now it's every article is basically just has a corporate logo or subtle bill Gil bill gates foundation or something like that um and you've seen it affect their reporting you know it's just got more and more just like glossy magazine-y, airy, empty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's what happens. So we, we stay outside. Of, but then the system is quite um, 
elegantly set up and it's hard to operate outside that 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 kind of that, those those incentives um and we we're four people at declassified we haven't got a lot of money um and we're basically just shaming the rest of the media with the stuff we're producing like relentlessly can you imagine so so I, I don't know how they make it hard but it's possible and and i think the, the best we're founded by the public and foundations but i think the best model is just subscribers but that's hard it's easier to do with people like you're talking about which is where it's sort of talking heads which mm -hmm. is obviously a, a valuable um a journalistic activity because it, ex it explains to people difficult issues and, and and you can talk about stuff but the stuff we're doing is investigative stuff mm -hmm. like um and that is a different sort of thing and has different impact yeah um and that's much harder to do um in, in terms of just time and all, all sorts of stuff like that so it's hard to create institutions like that i think we can i do i i don't quite agree with you about the the corporate the corporate media because I, I actually think that that I think that that analysis is probably right I think that they are kind of, I think they are going to collapse eventually you think so yeah I know what you're saying about like that uh, sort of um trophy <laughs> trophy assets for billionaires yeah, like yeah. Pesos or something it's not just that it's like like look through like through COVID they got millions and millions and millions and millions and it's just like okay like I understand why I kind of get why the government would decide to do that mm. you know like the putting out public health messages and paying for the pages that you're putting on it's like right okay principle fair enough mm. but you're telling me that that's not going to then influence your reporting on what the government is doing oh, in yeah, every course. other area yeah, yeah yeah you know and i think increasingly we're probably going to see more and more of that where governments are, are propping up yeah like media institutions like that's that's what concerns me but i think that another part of it is is they become increasingly just uh arms of the state or arms of corporations people don't their, their numbers are going down if you look at like cnn oh yeah they're, they're in the cnn's toilet. and cnn is like literally like I, f I feel more stupid after watching cnn i used to live in the states and i, I i'd much much prefer to watch fox news than than cnn much that's fucking but, saying something yeah but greg got feel fucking sean i would <laughs> because even though yeah i used to watch sean hannity and 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 although obviously i disagree with him about everything like you'd have some there'll be some debate there'll be some like intellectual movement whereas if you watch cnn it's just literally just blamond mm. just like there's, there's nothing there it's it's it's, 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 it's there's not there's nothing it's, there's no dynam uh, intellectual dynamism at all so i think that the more and more people turn off that kind of stuff people like it it will fail uh it's the tipping point when yeah no watching. it's a tipping point and also the problem we have is that it's hard to well, there's a lot of alternative media, but it's hard to maintain standards because because mm. people uh, 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 don't have the resources to have editors and blah 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 blah. So you still kind of rely on the papers of record for the kind of like real, or, or some people find, rely on them for for like the real um, facts. Mm. Whereas we need to create an institutional uh, infrastructure where we have institutions which are taken seriously and can't be dismissed easily. Mm. That hasn't happened yet. And also we need to create an institutional infrastructure for independent media where people can have a normal life and become independent journalists. Because right now, you're like, I've had to start your own thing. You have to work for like peanuts for a bunch of years. And, not, and people like want to have a, buy a house and have a mortgage and kids and stuff. There needs to be a, a route where people can do have a normal life um, without having to sell their soul to some establishment corporate media outlet. Um, and we haven't got that infra infrastructure yet. I don't know if, I think it's coming, but um, it's slowly. And yeah. it's where do you get the money if you're if you're outside of the corporate government system? Mm -hmm. Because they're the two main power centers in our society. I mean, what do you see as the best way to fund that kind of journalism? Is it the subscriber model? That's what, I think that's the, most, that's the most independent because then you're only, um, uh, you're only responsible to your readers who want the truth mm. um whereas the uh, uh, corporations um governments i just think that's wrong and then the other one is foundations which we are funded by foundations but again they have their own difficulties as well because although it's not corporate money it's foundations do have interests as well not that we've ever had anyone tell us to write anything um but that it's not perfect i think the perfect model is subscriber based and a lot of these people you're talking about the more sort of personality based mm. talk show people they can easily create um 
uh, the kind of financial backing that they need from from their from their viewers. Yeah, it's harder with what we do because yeah, yeah, you're, yeah well, the, the people can't associate with us on a personality level. You know, we live in that society where people like to feel like they're part of a yeah a personality team. But um, but we we we're, we're doing all right. We and the other thing is we don't want to. Ex- I well, my personal take is I don't want to expand too much because the other thing is the personnel. Like if you like if you start if you get bigger you have to take personnel from the mainstream and that slowly changes how you operate as well. If you look at somewhere like the Intercept, which I guess is the closest to what we tr- uh, mm. started, which Intercept yeah, yeah. was started. That's, in, uh, that's fuck. That's fuck it. Glenn Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald yeah, and yeah. Jeremy Scahill mm-hmm. and Laura Poitras. They started it. Two of them have now left. Yeah, but they they've got they had so much money, millions from Omidyar, the founder of eBay, mm-hmm. and they became but they and they employed like I don't know they got dozens of reporters now um who are on top wages i think but they but they've all got they've got them in from the new york times mm-hmm. and you have to and then slowly their reporting's just become more and more they look more and more like the mainstream media so i think that you have to guard against that as well uh so i don't mind staying small to that extent but mm. i mean with what we've done i have to say like <clears throat> it has been amazing to see what impact journalism can have even on like we're a tiny little organization we're only two reporters and yet we've like created a diplomatic fuffles for the for the uk in about five different latin american countries we've revealed all sorts of criminal activity across africa asia all different places all just just for a tiny little organization so there's a there, you can understand why the establishment don't want journalists with our kind of um uh, idea about what journalism should do to mm. be anywhere near big institutions with big resources because you'd, you British imperialism would probably stop tomorrow if you, yeah. if, if you started having a media if the BBC <clears throat> if the if an organization with the resources of the BBC for example had had journalists who were looking to expose power on the level that we are yeah things would change very quickly yeah yeah I remember realizing uh when I was in uni that I wanted to be a journalist and then a few years later realizing that there was no way I was ever going to be hired by any of the mainstream because yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like there's no way I just wouldn't write what they want me to exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. they would just I wouldn't even get through the door like they'd look at some of the stuff I'd written or talked about it and just be like no yeah 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 <laughs> took a while to explain that to my mom <laughs> still occasionally sends me like a channel four like job posted yeah. and I'm just like it's, well, it's, it's good not for you work. because they, most, a lot of people slowly change that's mm. like well that's they go in they don't they don't they don't do it consciously but when you start understanding what people want you to do mm. the propensity is to start doing it you know i'm very bad at being to doing what i'm told yeah so. same, same here <laughs> <laughs> anyway my uh we've blasted past an hour so uh i want to thank you for your time um everybody go by silent coup by corporations over through democracy yeah that's the title yeah, <laughs> yeah. um yeah, man. Is there anything else you want yeah. to plug? Declassified UK or like anything UK, else? Declassified yeah. UK, yeah. No, that's it. Buy the book, go to the website, and then, yeah, see what you think. Awesome. Thanks very much, man. All right, cheers. Hey, everyone. Thanks for making it right the way to the end of the podcast. I love that you tuned in this long. Do me a favor, hit subscribe, because 80% of you bastards are not subscribing, but you're watching my videos. See you next time.